welcome back. Um, thanks, everyone. Delighted to welcome the next session on this stage, a conversation with science between Giles Wattel, Global Affairs Editor for Tortoise Media, um, who's going to be in conversation with Dr. Adrian Glover from the Natural History Museum. If you want to submit your questions from the virtual audience, please do so, and we'll try and bring them into the room. Enjoy. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, it's very exciting. So, yes, I'm Giles Rattel. I'm with an editor with Tortoise. Um, I'm very excited uh, to be hosting this conversation in which Tortoise is sort of a minnow and the New York Times is the sperm whale. Um, I, I, let me just share with you a fact that I've just learned from Adrian. <laughs> it's really his to share, but I'm going to do it anyway. 45% of the world's surface is... Abyssal plain. Abyssal plain or abyssal plain? Abyssal. Abyssal plain. Not abysmal. Which will, yeah. <laughs> anyway, this is something that Adrian knows a lot more about than I do. And we could talk about it in general terms, but because this is the second week of COP, and it's when the rubber hits the road, and everyone wants to talk specifics about delivering climate solutions, I thought we'd start with the nitty gritty. Um, because one of the things that you are, have become an expert on is the deep ocean as a potential source of minerals for batteries that within 10, 15 years are going to be driving all our vehicles. So, uh, I mean, give us a, your general view of the pros and cons of looking there. Yeah, well, thanks, Charles. I think it's wonderful to be here. And, you know, so some people wonder what on earth, you know, these very specialist people in tiny little animals that live on the seafloor of the world's oceans are, are doing at a climate meeting. But it's astonishing how, and we've heard that earlier in some other panels, how uh, this debate of net zero and climate brings together people from a massive range of disciplines, and we've seen that certainly this week. Uh, but in particular, uh, one thing which you know, I'm passionate about is going into detail, uh, the detail that's required to think of what the solutions are to some of these really big picture problems. You know, climate change is a really big, really complex problem. Uh, it doesn't have a simple solution. Uh, and actually, as you as introduced there, uh, nowhere more can we see that uh, than in uh, these proposals, which are actually not new, but have been resurfaced, uh, if you like, uh, uh, maybe almost a correct analogy, uh, to extract our minerals that we need to, to convert this enormous fleet of petrol and diesel combustion engines uh, into electric vehicles. Uh, that requires astonishing amounts of minerals. It has to come from somewhere uh, on the table uh, right now is the concept of mining that in the deep sea. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a quite remarkable story. Started in the 1960s. Uh, surveys went out to these environments. Real focus on the abyssal plain. We mentioned that the most ubiquitous feature of our planet, this endless plains of seafloor sea mud, uh, four to 5,000 meters in depth. Uh, but back in the 1960s, geologists and others noticed that it was covered in these remarkable surface formation, these little polymetallic nodules, potato-sized accretions, concretions of mineral. Uh, we now know are very rich in cobalt, nickel, copper, uh, and other minerals, and cobalt and nickel obviously particularly key uh, for the net zero future. Ah. So goodness, you know, that it started out as an idea that this could be mined to, you know, essentially get copper and so on and nickel that were used in, you know, heavy industries in the 70s and 80s, and now here it is on the table as the solution. Uh, and it's taken a, a long conversation uh, to sort of get to where we are, uh, but the situation as it is, uh, is there's sort of two ways of looking at it. One is it sounds scary, it sounds frightening, you've got a, a potential for major biodiversity loss in an environment that we know almost nothing about. On the other hand, you've got the, the fact that remarkably, uh, possibly for the first time ever, uh, we had an international treaty developed in the 70s and 80s, the Law of the Sea Treaty, which wasn't designed as an environmental treaty, uh, but effectively uh, put the brakes on seabed mining, created a United Nations body with 168 delegations that go every year to discuss, can this be done in a, a way which is legal, which is economically fair to all of the world? There's just a remarkable common heritage of mankind, common heritage of humankind, you know, the oceans as a global commons uh, framework within that 
document. That's very much the sort of product of the 70s, uh, uh, you know, of a, a potential sort of utopian future. Um, hasn't all worked out. But then, you know, finally, can it be done in a way that's environmentally sustainable? And that's a, it's an enormous question uh, that requires a tremendous amount of detail. You know, we've been working now for 10 or 15 years trying to understand the biodiversity of these environments so that we can inform those policymakers, inform people in fora like this uh, of what the, what the pros and the cons are um, and but whether that, you know, it can be acceptable or not. Just to be clear about the big picture, uh, deep sea mining for these minerals is not happening yet. For all that we see news stories about machines going out and trawling, it's not happening on a commercial scale yet. But um, if, if we ruled it out, would we be able to find enough of these materials on land? So the, there are still vast terrestrial reserves of these deposits. And ultimately, I mean, the question that you're alluded to is whether is it essentially, it is a simple question that has not an easy answer, like many of the things you'll hear at this mm. meeting. Uh, is it better or worse to get your battery metals uh, from terrestrial deposits uh, or from the deep sea? Uh, we have a, a, a kind of a, a scaling problem, an observational problem uh, with the ocean. It's astonishingly difficult to monitor. Uh, it's extremely remote. We have something like in the environment I work with, uh, over 80% of the animals that we bring up in our samples. You know, I'm, I'm actually, a lot of my time is a taxonomist. I describe new species. We have a research group. Where we study the evolution of the deep sea fauna. Over 80% of the things are just new to science. When we describe them, they don't have a scientific name. So we have to actually put names on them, start to figure out what they're related to, where they sit in the tree of life. And this opens up then uh, the ability uh, to sort of do uh, impact studies. You know, if you think about drug development, you know, we're, living in the, we're living in the last couple of years in a world dominated by you know, media headlines of you know, phase one, two, and three trials. You know, we're all familiar with that terminology now. Uh, you can actually translate that to something like seabed mining. We're at the phase where it's basic, pure research, almost, to discover what lives there. Then you can go, once you've established that, you establish some kind of baseline of knowledge, uh, you can then move on to well, let's work out what the impact is, and then you become kind of in the sort of industrial sector a little bit, just like when you move a drug from, you know, from the academic sector into the uh, industry sector, and then eventually it gets taken over by a you know, big pharma and, and produced as a product, which we did in a remarkable space of time in, in the last year, showing the power of science to, to provide solutions right, to our planet. And we have to do that in the deep sea. You know, we, we, we don't have, on a funding base, the same level of funding that people had to develop a COVID vaccine in the space of a few months. Uh, this is a, a process that's been going on for 20 years to research yeah, the biodiversity of our seafloor. Uh, but it starts with that knowledge. It starts with detail. The late uh, Lord Robert May, he is uh, the former amazing Princeton theoretical physicist and ecologist, a bit of a, you know, a legend for us in the world of science, and uh, eventually the chief scientific advisor to the UK government. He always used to say, it's all in the detail. Uh, and this, this is an example of that problem, uh, where to get to the solution, you, there is no kind of quick solution, uh, moratorium on seabed mining. Well, there actually is already a moratorium on seabed mining, you know, we, until we work out whether it's acceptable or not. Uh, what there is a need for is detailed knowledge and detailed studies, just as there is with forestries, with uh, figuring out sustainable fisheries, etc. These are not simple solutions. And I, you know, I know that policymakers, it's horrible to hear it from scientists saying that further research is needed. You know, it's like it's the end of every document that we write. Uh, and it's what we always say. Uh, but ultimately, you know, those solutions require a tremendous amount of knowledge, uh, mm. and we have to, you know, rapidly develop that. Uh, and, and that's you know, th th those solutions will come, uh, but there will be, you know, a big decision on the horizon. Right. And the, the, so the, the real societal question is what level of risk you're prepared to accept. And you could argue that in something like seabed mining, you know, we're a long way from being able to make that decision. Uh, but it will be a societal decision. It'll be a decision certainly in the high seas, thanks to the law of the sea treaty taken uh, by a, a body set up under United Nations law. Uh, and I think that's a very positive message there, uh, that we have that process and it, it could be stopped. You know, if, uh, if, if nation states, entities, observers, you know, don't want, really don't want deep sea mining, uh, that forum is there to ensure that it doesn't happen. Uh, so there you are. You know, it's, it's, it is a positive story there. Right. I mean, it, it's well worth noting that you, you're being given the space, as it were, to uh, accumulate this detailed, pure scientific mm -hmm. knowledge before the machines It never happened in. with high seas fisheries. You right. Know, it, it didn't happen with oil and gas. Even in, 
if you go back to the 80s, oil and gas in the North Sea was a pretty wild frontier, you know, with very limited regard to the health and safety of the people, <laughs> let alone the environment. Yeah. You know, that's massively improved now. The UK and, and, and other European states have, you know, extremely good environmental safety record in the North Sea. Like, but, it, but at the beginning, you know, it was, a, it was a pretty, a pretty much a frontier. And it certainly hasn't happened on land. But I mean, if you can look forward 10, 20 years, do you think that in principle it is plausible to envisage a situation in which commercial deep sea mining has begun, but only in... A, a tiny fraction of the vast, vast area that, so the, that you work in, and that, that that can be enforced? Probably very quickly to introduce uh, three types of deep sea mining. Right. Okay, so there's mining of hydrothermal vents. For, these are called massive sulfides, rich in copper, gold, zinc, and other deposits. There's mining of seamount crusts. And then there's mining of what I've mostly been referring to, which is polymetall polymetallic nodules. These all used to be called manganese nodules, discovered in the 1870s on the seafloor of the Pacific. Uh, I've said this publicly before, and I'm going to say it today. I, I cannot see a, a sustainable conservation strategy for the mining of active hydrothermal vent sites. I cannot see a sustainable conservation strategy for mining a seamount covered in remarkable endemic fauna, sponge gardens, cold water coral reefs, simply because these environments are quite rare and isolated on the seafloor. They're filled with endemic species. Vents are filled with the most evolutionary novelty you've ever found. You know, this is places where life may have originated. I, I, I'm, I, I always remain open. Uh, I just can't see, as a conservation scientist, a pathway uh, where you develop that. And seamounts, vents, the mineral deposits are fairly small. Uh, I think my fellow resource geologists would agree with me. Nodules, on the other hand, there is, there's a couple of cards that you've got. Uh, so one is there's the, the scale of it is unbelievable. 6,000 kilometers in one direction by 1,500 in another. It's an area, the contiguous landmass of the United States, very comparable, say, area. And it is an enormous region. And there's no conceivable, unless, I don't know how many battery vehicles Elon Musk wants to build, but there's no conceivable pathway where you're going to mine that entire thing. It's completely and utterly bonkers. There's something like three times the global terrestrial reserves of cobalt and nickel. But without getting alarmist, if you mine a bit of it, what is the so that, potential for that's further... The, that's the question. Uh, so let's say it's a very small percentage. Uh, so say, say, say a contractor, a nation state, and it's actually not, mostly not private industry it's interested, it's mostly governments at the moment. Uh, say they'll, they'll lease a block, start to mine that environment. Uh, there will be some biodiversity lost there. Yeah, we have set up under the United Nations, the International Seabed Authority, a vast network already of protected regions that run right across that entire environment. And that was thanks to a colleague of mine and reports that I was involved with as a PhD student, weirdly enough, like 20 years ago. Uh, reports that we wrote suddenly ended up, in the, you know, talk about policy impact, uh, we suddenly ended up protecting vast areas of the Pacific. It's not written, you know, the lawyers, and maybe lawyers in this room, you know, they will know that it's not legally quite the same as a nation state marine protected area. Uh, but they're there, uh, and it's an astonishing amount of protection. Uh, within those mining blocks, the contractors will have to have additional reserve areas. Uh, so we're, we're piling at the moment reserve areas on reserve areas onto them. Uh, and you know, I think that is the right solution. I think it, it's totally conceivable uh, that in that time frame that you spoke of, there is a small amount of or, you know, nearing commercial mineral extraction. But there will be monitoring the, you know, the, the, the hell out of it, I'd like to use that phrase. It will be, all eyes will be on that. Uh, what is the biodiversity loss we're experiencing? You know, climate is this problem in the, you know, we see CO2, you see battery metals, you see fossil fuels. There's a, there's a real message uh, where we have to build a kind of climate future where we don't lose biodiversity. Right. Bio you know, we can, we, you know, technically, physically, in terms of earth science, mod you know, we can, potentially bring the carbon down and fix that problem. You can't bring species back. You can't bring biodiversity that you've lost back. You know, in, the, in where we are now in the UK, it's a managed landscape where we've just got rid of most of our biodiversity. Uh, and we have these amazing wilderness regions uh, which are filled with biodiversity that we don't know much about. We've, some bits we've protected. We've protected the Antarctic. We haven't really done very well with the Arctic. Uh, we've protected some areas of our seafloor in a rather you know, haphazard draw, draw a box on a map kind of way normally in areas where people don't go. 
Uh, so it, kind of easy from a political point of view. Uh, you know, we can get into the MPA debate and it was spoken about earlier at this meeting. Uh, and we're there with the seabed mining. We're right in the, in the center of those sort of questions. But Adrian, uh, go back to your PhD for a second and tell us about the biodiversity yeah, that you've discovered. I would love to talk to you about worms. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But hang on, I'm so, going what, to... Yeah, what, how often do you get to talk about worms to an international climate conference? So, uh, annelid, annelid worms. The, the, the animal... OK, look at this way. I've read a report sent to, uh, uh, jo uh, to um, uh, the, the president in the early 80s, Ronald Reagan, uh, from NOAA, the National Oceanog Oceanographic Aeronautical uh, Administration, into the first seabed mining report. So, dear Mr. President, basically, uh, it's fine. Uh, there's no biology there. There's no biodiversity there. Uh, you know, obviously, we'll do some surveys, but don't worry about the, the We're environment. We're talking about three and a half kilometers down. Yeah, three and a half kilometers down. Uh, but at the same time, so an amazing group of scientists at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography started going out to abyssal plains just off, you know, off San Diego, out into the North Pacific, uh, taking careful samples of mud, sieving them really carefully on very fine sieves, and they got back, and this is bizarre. So essentially, in a square meter of seafloor, or the abyssal plain, um, if you go to your garden, you, know, you dig up a few spadefuls of, of soil, and you've got like hundreds and hundreds of worms and insect larvae and all kinds of uh, biological activity. And the seafloor, you know, there's nothing here. Hang on a minute. No, there's like 50, 50 animals just scattered over the, in, in the mud, so, you know, very sparsely distributed. And they start looking at them, and they're, oh, this is weird. They're, they're all, all of them are different species. This is the weirdest system ever. Uh, it, it's the, the astonishingly low abundance, but extraordinarily high biodiversity. I mean, there's not many terrestrial examples, a bit like the Karoo Desert in South Africa, where you have these like, low productivity, but astonishingly high diversity. So it suddenly turned out uh, this environment that was being explored for seabed minerals. I was like, oh my God, this is actually an extremely high biodiversity environment. Uh, and it, that diversity is in small annelid worms. You mentioned these polychaetes. Uh, you've got mollusks. There's many things we're a little bit familiar with, starfish, brittle stars, sea cucumbers. If we talk about the charismatic megafauna of the abyssal plain, you might expect some sort of you know, giant beasts roaming around. <laughs> They're about this big. That's enormous for us. And uh, what would that be called? Uh, the sea cucumbers are the big ones. Okay. Uh, 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 gummy squirrels, we sometimes call them. But you're still, eccentric. <laughs> you're still bringing up brand new species. Yeah, all the time. On and on yeah. and on. We've so described, since 2000, we've described 168 new species from the abyssal plain out of what I think is about probably about six or 7,000 species left there to describe. So it's like, sort of, it's like being at the beginning of a, you know, an ocean voyage in the you know, 17th century when you're going out. and it's, a, it's quite amazing. And what is the... We were talking about the sort of metaphysical, philosophical value of leaving all this intact, regardless of yeah. its impact or otherwise on our species. But what is, if you start messing with that low abundance, high bi biodiversity mud, um, is there a ripple effect more broadly? Uh, what, what is the sort of well, yeah. planetary damage that you're going to yeah. do? I mean, you touched on the, you know, the metaphysical and the conceptual. I mean, one of the things that we have to, we struggle with uh, is, you know, what's conservation for? Is it, is it for us? Is it to ensure you preserve a coral reef so that you have fisheries, so you have tourism, so you have uh, you know, an environment that will provide you with a service, maybe carbon drawdown, whatever it is? Or is it for nature? You know, in the deep sea and Antarctica, there's very similar conceptual arguments. And ultimately, Mars, you know, when Mr. Musk sends the rockets there, you'll have, have to think about this from a conservation point of view as well. You know, what's it for? Is it for nature or is it for us? And in the deep sea, uh, there are no fisheries, no one lives there, no one's view is going to be spoilt by a mining contractor driving his machines around. There's not going to be really a loss of tourism. So these are all things which, if you look at the environmental impact survey of a terrestrial mine, they're like boom, 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 like water quality, soil pollution, noise, uh, loss of tourism, uh, you know, disturbance of uh, local people and cultures. Uh, you know, we see that all, these are all impacts on humans. So we have to translate into an environment where people don't live and people don't go on holiday and people don't get food. New conservation arguments. And the most powerful one, and it isn't being made enough. You know, I've, I've sat often with environmental groups who are really active on seabed mining and said, you need to be making really good conservation arguments for the, CB, for the deep sea. And the, and the argument, and I think, and I, and I stand by this, that you know, when a little kid walks into the Natural History Museum and it's an inspiring view of a whales and dinosaurs and that, that inspirational nature around us is so critical 
so critical that we have places on our planet which are still the wilderness areas. And that, that's the powerful message. We used it to protect Antarctica. There's a bit of politics there as well, but we, that people really did buy into that. Um, that even though it's a place that we don't live, we're gonna protect it. And um, we're not doing so well with the fisheries around the Southern Ocean, but we, we, are made, we have made progress there. And, and the seabed, you know, in the seabed, I, I, I said, I, you know, I don't think you can take deep sea mining off the table. Net zero has to be achieved. Uh, uh, but the conservation arguments have to be powerful. Uh, and the reality is there are no fisheries there. So it, these impacts will, will unlikely to have some sort of ripple effect on our fisheries or some mm. massive impact on carbon draw. I mean, like carbon draw, I mean, it's massive. Like the ocean is this enormous carbon sink, okay? Uh, and, you know, both chemically through carbon dioxide just literally dissolving into the water and also from uh, plankton on the surface pulling the carbon down. So what happens at 5,000 meters in the central Pacific will not have a big effect on that. Uh, but the, uh, there's a powerful conservation message that we can't ignore. And if you want to have uh, achieve this transition from a hydrocarbon-based energy storage to a metal-based one, <laughs> metals are going to have to come from somewhere. Hmm. And then we have uh, my colleague Richard Harrington in the audience here, who's an expert in ore geology. Uh, yeah, this is this is written wonderful Nature paper on that recently. This material has to come from somewhere. We have to have that debate. Uh, all options have got to be on the table. Uh, but we have to go into it with the detailed knowledge uh, yeah. and the transparency and the open communication uh, and ultimately the public dialogue. Uh, if it, all the time with marine protected areas, you see these boxes being drawn and there's 30 by 30 or the 50 by 50, or whatever initiative it is, it's wonderful. But when we've made those policy decisions, how are we going to translate the benefits of that protection to, to all of humanity? You know, that's the challenge. You know, organizations, I'm very fortunate to work in an organization that its, its mission is, is to do that. You know, that's, our, that's our mission, is to create advocates for the planet, to understand biodiversity, to make people inspired by nature. And you know, it's a wonderful thing. Public dialogue. We've we got about some, 10 I've been talking left. too much, clearly. Um, you know, let's have some public do, dialogue. Do uh, hit us with any uh, questions that you may have for Adrian. Um, just looking for hands up. I've got one. Yeah. Talking about this... Uh, role that the ocean has as a carbon sink. And forgive me for hitting you with GCSE uh, science here, but I haven't got beyond that. It's also a heat sink, right? So uh, it's absorbing a lot of heat as well as... Yeah. Um, uh, how worried do we need to be about that all coming back in the form of atmospheric rivers and um, extreme weather well, the events? Well, the big worry is acidification, which is set, okay. in, which is, you know, you know, set in stone. I mean, uh, we're not going to bring carbon dioxide back down like dramatically like it's going up right and we've got to level it off uh so ocean acidification is just a, just a chemical fact it's going to happen um and you know that's we've got two to five thousand years of that i'm not an ocean chemist but you know i can tell you it's not that not that complicated we, it, it there's a big buffer in this system and the ocean takes that uh, obviously absorbs heat as well um which, you know which is just a physical process uh but that chemistry uh, has a, you know, a dramatic effect, and particularly on shallow water seas, you know, where you know, the carbonate chemistry is critical. You've got coral formation, you've got many organisms which rely on producing carbonate to survive, you know, all mollusks, you know, corals, etc. Uh, and they, you know, that, that we know they will be severely impacted uh, by and, that. And, and is the um, uh, band of uh, tolerance as narrow for species in shallow ocean in terms of acidification? Well, deep sea, I mean, as yeah, uh, deep sea it will be affected by ocean acidification. It's quite a big time lag, you know, it's like, because right. you've got global circulation, you've got several hundred years for that, that water to be passed right around into the, into the global thermohaline circulation. Uh, it will, you know, have pretty negative impact, particularly on deep water corals, um, because they, they're kind of at the front line. And you go into very deep water, it actually becomes very hard chemically to create calcium carbonate because of pressure. Uh, so any animal which, create, which needs a shell, uh, in a more acid in the ocean will struggle. So there will be a shift. Oh. Um, so is that why we're talking sort of soft? Um, yeah, that's why in the Bristol Plain, you don't have many shelly things. Okay, basically, it's ext extremely energetically costly to create a, a carbonate shell uh, oh. in very high pressure environment. We've got a question. Yeah. yeah. We do have some microphones, by the yeah, way. We should I have a mic. Yeah. Need one? Here we go. There we go. It's coming. Um, you've spoken uh, very much, and rightly so, about the amount of scientific knowledge we need to have before we make informed decisions um, about whether or not to mine uh, the seabed. 
Is there an end point to that? How do we know when we've got enough knowledge? Because I know. if we leave it up to governments, especially as it becomes increasingly politically charged, who owns the means of producing these batteries? Well, this is, this is a very good question, and this is a one-person panel, <laughs> so like, you know, the scientists will say further research is needed. But, the, they, you know, but you, we know, let's imagine there was a contractor here, there was someone who wanted to build EVs. Like, you know, like, there's a range of voices that have to be heard, and then it'll, it's about how much risk you want to accept. Okay? If you can imagine a scenario where seabed mining is by legal arrangement started very small, and then you could say, well, there's a monitoring process, blah, 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 and then after five years, it's like, yeah, you're nay, et cetera. Um, so there, there are ways of mitigating that risk, uh, but it's about how much risk. I mean, I, you know, we could do another two years of work and start mining, or 20 years, uh, and then after two years, we will have this much knowledge, and after 20, this much, and after 2,000, so there, you know, we've been, we've, been working on describing the fauna and the flora of, uh, of our planet Earth, you know, the, the, the surface system, the terrestrial system, for maybe four or five hundred years. Uh, it's only 50 years we've been doing it in the deep sea. Uh, uh, so it ultimately is a, it, you know, but net zero is like that's something we've, we've got to get to uh, and beyond. I think that people want to have transport. So, that, you know, those are, it's a societal decision. Someone has to you know, take that risk and we have to share it equally. You know, the, the ocean is this amazing, you know, commons, uh, you know, where we, you know, as you, if you go walking in, I live in South London, you know, go walking on common land and you think, well, who's in charge of this? Like Wimbledon Common, where the tennis tournament is. Who's in charge of, of this? You know, there's like a committee or something that like run it, but it's not owned by anyone. Uh, and, you know, the challenge in the policy space and the science space and this, these spaces are, are to think how you know, we deliver, you know, a, a commons, a, a managed, sustainable commons that doesn't become, you know, a tragedy. Like, you know, this is the, the economic, the famous economic ar argument of the tragedy of the commons, and that's the, old, that's the real challenge. We've got one Another here. question. I don't know if you know the answer to this until we start mining, but you're talking about biodiversity. See if we're to start mining, how would it regenerate itself, or would it regenerate? So if we were to give a company yeah, acres, that's a really good question. Would yeah. that last them a lifetime? Okay, so in, in hydrothermal vent mining, for example, which I've sort of ruled out by personally, you know, my own conservation space, I can't see how you do it, but there, there is a sort of argument that the vent systems grow back, okay, because they're, they're underwater thermal springs, the precipitating minerals, they do form again. Nodules form at a rate of one millimeter per million years. Uh, so those nodules, once you did it, they're not coming back <laughs> for a very long time. It will be a, a nodule-free sedimented environment. Uh, it will be changed for a very long period of time, and it, will, it won't be abiotic because it's a food-limited environment down there, so as long as there's food coming in from the surface, which there will continue to be, it, it won't be without biology. It'll just be dramatically changed. There is a sort of rehabilitation. Of course, in the terrestrial mine, there's often now a lot of rehabilitation that goes on after it's closed. That doesn't translate very well <laughs> to the seabed. Um, for one thing, a lot of rehabilitation in terrestrial mine is about you know, creating a kind of nature park or something for humans to you know, enjoy and go sailing or something like that. These things don't translate well. Uh, it'll be about monitoring that and understanding what we've lost, um, what's coming back, uh, understanding particularly how well the protected areas are doing at maintaining uh, biodiversity, uh, and, and that will be absolutely critical. Uh, it, so it will be very different. Uh, it won't like rehabilitate, basically. You know, so it will be changed per permanently, at least on the tens of millions of years time scale. I think we've got time for one more question. One, mil one millimeter per million but, years, yeah? Yeah. So let's not kid ourselves by talking about uh, this harvesting. Uh, there was a gentleman at the back. Have you got a microphone? Yeah, Great. Microphone, thank you. Um, my, my question is, is, isn't there a, a huge moral hazard? The extractive industries don't have the best reputation for environmental protection, even in if you take a, a mineral like lithium, uh, terrestrial resources, you have indigenous groups trying to protect water tables, those kinds of things, and, and still being, you know, uh, 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 overpowered by, by by huge extractive processes. Um, what happens in the case of the oceans, where you, you don't even have yeah. people there to defend them because it is a common, exactly yeah. as you described? Well, the answer is create an international treaty, uh, which creates a body where that can be discussed and decided upon in a way which is fair and legal for everyone. And we've made massive strides, and I, am, you know, I completely agree. Uh, however, let's look at the positives, think of the positive solutions, think how to go forward. 
we have to engage with the international process. We've created the International Seabed Authority. It's an organization which needs our help, policy makers, stakeholders, voters, scientists, the whole industry. They, you know, it's a small institution which needs the help to, to make those decisions and to get the regulations right so that that doesn't happen. Well, we're very nearly out of time. Dr. Adrian Glover, thank you so much. Really fascinating insight into a very large part of the world where we've actually been able to observe the precautionary principle rather than blundering in as we have on, on terra firma and learn by often tragic experience. So this has been a conversation with science and there'll be more tomorrow and the next day. And thank you very much to the New York Times and above all to you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>